Everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavich and Dr. Erica Riegelman. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers Podcast, and I am super excited to have uh, our guest today. It's Dr. Jolene Brightland. She's got one of the hottest books right now in uh, functional medicine, uh, and I'd say overall, and she's talking about uh, birth control and Beyond the Pill is the name of the book. So Dr. Jolene Brighton, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hey there. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to chat today. Yeah. So can you give our listeners and viewers a little background about you and how you came about to writing this book, Beyond the Pill? Totally. So, well, if the first thing to know is not, I'm not anti-birth control. In fact, I used the pill myself for 10 years. I'm a first generation college student. So thank you, birth control. But there was a whole lot of issues I had while I was on birth control. And then when I transitioned off, I developed post-birth control syndrome. Now at the time, I didn't really know what was going on and I didn't question birth control. I was just grateful to have those painful, heavy periods go away and not get pregnant. These things all winning in my book. So I was on the pill for 10 years. I am a nutritional biochemist who then went to naturopathic medical school. That was about the time I came off the pill when I learned that, wait a minute, I'm only fertile one day out of the month, and yet I take hormones to suppress my body every single day. And you know, we, a lot of us, we don't even know wh- how we can get pregnant and when we're fertile until we decide that we do want to get pregnant. Now, I developed post-birth control syndrome, but not that I was a freak and the only one because my doctor did a good job convincing me that this, this is not a thing. This is just my body. And fast forward to when I get into clinical practice and I come to observe that the majority, if not all of women struggle to come off of hormonal birth control. And I got this reputation as the doctor who believed women's birth control stories, which at first when people would call up and say, I want to schedule an appointment with you because I hear you believe women's birth control stories. I was like, what a weird thing to say. Like, of course I believe your story. But as I sat one-on-one for hours with thousands of patients, I came to understand that Most of us are past hormonal birth control for symptom management with little discussion of how our body works, what those symptoms mean. And when side effects do come up, we're often dismissed and we're told, here's another medication, or this is just the new you, you're getting older. Like, believe it or not, I've had 20 somethings in my office and their doctor said, oh, you're just getting older. I'm like, I don't want to hear that till you're 90. I don't want to hear that like 24 is old. Like that is, what is that about? Um, And with that, you know, my patients really came to teach me and guide me in a lot of the protocols that I developed that are in Beyond the Pill. So It's called Beyond the Pill to give women a root cause solution to their hormone imbalance beyond birth control so that you can get to an understanding of what do these symptoms mean and what to do about it. Also get all the information you need to stay safe on birth control if you do choose to use it and then transition off and hopefully avoid post-birth control syndrome and the many issues that come up as we discontinue hormonal birth control. So uh, the ironic thing about all of this is that I spent two years in a homeless youth clinic dispensing a lot of birth control. And after that time, I was like, I'm done. I told my husband, I'm starting my private practice. I'm not going to talk about birth control anymore. And then I wrote a whole book. <laughs> so I would awesome. say from a, from a, you know, my patient. Are you guys frozen or is it just me? I'm here. Eric, are you okay? I think All we right. just had a little glitch. <laughs> All right. So we'll, gl- we'll, we'll edit we'll that edit out. <laughs> so Jolene, from a man's perspective, right, I would say the vast majority of men are kind of unaware or ignorant to the fact that uh, why a lot of women take birth control pills. The mm-hmm. assumption is that women take birth control just so that they don't get pregnant. And the reality is there is, you know, we're all in, in this world of functional medicine. We know that, that there's a large percentage of women uh, that are taking birth control and hormones in general because of other reasons, abnormal cycles, mm-hmm. pain, all those things. So how big of, a, how big of an issue is uh, birth control and how many people are taking it, you think, from a, just to not get pregnant? How many women are taking it really just to try and normalize uh, or try and get a more normal uh, menstrual cycle? Yeah. Well, when we look at the pill specifically, there's 100 million women worldwide that are taking hormonal birth control, the pill specifically. And with that, it's estimated that about 58% of it, uh, these women take hormonal birth control primarily for symptom management. So 
This was a medication that was designed for a young, healthy female population to control their reproductive health. And we can be grateful that we have that tool. However, now, you know, I call it the pill for every female ill. You've got period problems of any kind, any lady part issues, and your past hormonal birth control. And you guys talk a lot about thyroid. You know, thyroid, hypothyroidism, that can present as irregular periods, missing periods, inability to conceive. Now, if it's inability to conceive, you're not likely going to get birth control. But if you have heavy periods, periods that don't stop, like they just go on and on, you're having weird spotting and you're like, what's going on in my body? Or you lose your period altogether, that may very well be the first sign of hypothyroidism for you. And unfortunately, many women are past hormonal birth control with no discussion of this. I've seen women in my office who are now in their 30s, you know, TSH is up in the double digits. So for people listening, thyroid stimulating hormone, your brain is screaming at your thyroid. And when we go through their history and their timeline, it started with at 17, I started, I was really tired. I couldn't get out of bed. You know, I, I couldn't poop. Nobody cared about any of that, but my period was irregular and I never knew it was coming. So my doctor just said, take the pill. This is a big problem because now this woman has been poorly managed for her hypothyroidism. Like all of those symptoms, that's, can I say definitively she was hypothyroid? No, but those symptoms, because I didn't do the test then, but those symptoms are a hallmark of hypothyroidism. And so this is a big issue. When we pass women the pill, the patch, the ring, the IUD, we give her the depo shot, like any of these contraceptives without discussing why or investigating, we could be masking some significant issues. And hypothyroidism, as you guys know, many of your listeners may know, if that's not treated, things get a lot worse. And this is where we sometimes see people in their 40s and 50s with congestive heart failure because they haven't had adequate thyroid medication. And even more alarming is the root cause of their thyroid condition hasn't been investigated, which could be rooted in autoimmunity, the number one cause of hypothyroidism in the United States. Birth control makes all of these things so much worse. So on top of not treating the root cause and putting a Band-Aid over these symptoms, the doctor's done a disservice in not investigating what is actually going on in these, in these women. And I say Band-Aid because, you know, there's certainly, there's always women who say, well, but I got on birth control and it fixed my acne. And to that I say, but what happens when you come off? Oh, my acne comes back. Well, just like a Band-Aid, while a Band-Aid covers up a wound, the Band-Aid isn't healing the wound. It's just covering it up so you don't see it. Arguably, it is protecting things as well. But with that, it's the same with hormonal birth control. If you have to take this medication and if you come off of it, those symptoms come back, it really hasn't fixed anything. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the struggle for a lot of women is that they're afraid that, you know, that little pill that they're taking is fixing all of these big problems. You know, my acne, my heavy periods, I don't have cramping. I, you know, my period is really light. And so when you, when they realize that maybe the birth control is not good for them or suggesting that it's not good for them, they often become very fearful of, well, then all my acne is going to come back and I'm going to have these heavy periods and I don't think I can deal with that. And it's a fear-based, uh, yeah. and again, they're, they're, they're not realizing that it's that underlying mechanism that was never addressed, you know, back in your teens when you first got put on it. And again, mm -hmm. yeah, thyroid, the, the thyroid symptoms are often coinciding with what they're getting put in birth control for in the first place. And a lot of doctors think that it's just the, you know, in your teens, you're too young to have a thyroid issue. Let's just put you on the pill. It'll normalize things. When you get past puberty, everything will be normal again. But again, we're finding when these women come off of it, then they're, then they're really still having the issues. And then they have all of the added stuff that went along with the post-birth control syndrome. So can you explain a little bit about what post-birth control syndrome is when these women come off of it? Oh yeah. And I just want to say thank you for addressing that really important piece that a lot of women's health, the decisions that are made are based in fear. And so if I did my job right and be on the pill, you won't be afraid to stop hormonal birth control, to be on hormonal birth control. I really want to dispel fear by providing you with that education. One of those things is there's an entire chapter about post-birth control syndrome. So you touched on acne. Acne is the biggest reason I see women get right back on hormonal birth control because nobody likes to look like a teenager in their 30s and their 40s. And I feel that. I personally developed cystic acne for the first time in my life when I came off of hormonal birth control. I mean, 
So I'd never had this before that I was like, what is on my face? Like, it didn't even occur to me this was acne at first. I was like, I must have bug bites. Like, this is something else going on. So hormonal birth control, when we understand that while it was very well designed to impact just the reproductive system, it impacts every single system in your body. And if you understand that, then you can understand how post-birth control syndrome can present with so many signs and symptoms. So post-birth control syndrome is the collection of the signs and symptoms that arise when you discontinue hormonal birth control. On average, we see that about four to six months after stopping any form of hormonal birth control, symptoms will really present themselves. For some women, it's much sooner. For some women, it's much later. I've seen women two years later, five years later, eight years later, and uh, they're presenting with symptoms. Their doctor says this is in no way related to hormonal birth control. But in functional medicine, we have this awesome tool called the timeline. And when you leverage that tool, it's not hard to see that actually she had symptoms when she came off, but her body was so good at adapting and she was so good at powering through that she persevered until it was too much. And that's what landed her in the doctor's office. And these symptoms, can present, like I said, acne. So uh, this can be the return of acne or new onset of acne. And this is important to understand because some doctors say post-birth control syndrome is just the return of symptoms that you had before. It's your normal returning. But Sometimes, yes, and other times, no. Other times, it can be the first time a woman has seen her period go missing. We've had patients that had 10 years of regular predictable periods, and then five years after being on birth control, they come off and their period's nowhere to be seen for years on end. So you can have missing period, heavy period, irregular periods, really any kind of period problem. We can see acne, psoriasis, weird rashes, eczema coming up, hair loss. We can also see neurological issues like new onset of migraines, anxiety, depression, brain fog, having mood swings and irritability. We certainly see digestive issues and we can get a lot more <laughs> into that because hormonal birth control impacts the digestive tract in a big way. So we can see gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, yeast overgrowth, issues with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, gallbladder dysfunction, and the list really goes on and on. So if you're a woman on hormonal birth control right now, chart your symptoms. You'll want to get into the protocols around beyond the pill, which is very rooted in diet and lifestyle strategies because this is what I found. If you do that work, the transition is so much easier and you're less likely to end up with like these horrific symptoms that some women have. And then as you come off, you want to continue to document those things so that you create your own timeline that if in the event you need to meet with a practitioner, you have so much data to offer them to really help you fast track your healing. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, the timeline for me in my practice is critical because you really get an understanding of where problems likely started, their root cause issues, um, versus them just showing up in your office and think this is the new issue, right? Mm -hmm. This is usually the, the long-term effect. And a couple of things you said I think are really important. And one of those is, is that... Um, a, just because you take estrogen physiology, take birth control and you change your estrogen physiology so that and your hormone physiology so that you've kind of normalized the bleeding cycle, uh, flooding the system with that estrogen has ramifications in all other systems. Uh, and, and so there is a transition. You change the physiology when you flood the system. And so it does take time not only uh, for you to reestablish a normal hormone physiology and if you're lucky and your physiology was normal before birth control, then it may be possibly it's a little easier coming off of the birth control. But if you had underlying issues before that, like chronic hypothyroidism and especially cellular hypothyroidism before that, uh, you still are likely going to have to deal with the compromised or altered chemistry caused by thyroid uh, adaptation, right? And so they've got really mm -hmm. two, two big things. And so for I can see why from from a female's perspective, like, hey, right now this is this isn't perfect, but I can deal with this. Versus the the concern or the fear coming off of uh, all of those and having the potential to have to deal with some of those things. Mm -hmm. So there's a big tie between hypothyroidism. Oh yeah, and you know the issue. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> yeah. I think we're free somewhere, either you or me is freezing, but so there's a big tie between hypothyroidism, right? And estrogen, um, 
and problems with with hormone regulation, right? So mm -hmm. can you explain some of the tie-in of how estrogen, altered estrogen physiology can affect uh, thyroid physiology and how altered thyroid physiology could affect estrogen physiology? Yeah, well, and when we're talking about, like, I want to flesh out this important differentiation here as well is that we for a long time thought the synthetic estrogen was the biggest troublemaker. And now we've understood with the newer research that the progestin, which is synthetic progesterone, is also an issue. And in fact, there's a higher correlation with depression with women on progestin-only contraceptives than on combination estrogen and progestin, which is very interesting. So, but to your point with thyroid physiology, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I always think is kind of funny in... Um, when we start talking endocrinology and it's like, you go to the gynecologist if you've got lady part hormones and, and then, then you go to the endocrinologist if it's like anything else. So if it's thyroid, adrenal, and yet all of these interact with each other. So the way I like to explain hormones when we're talking about the ovarian, adrenal, and thyroid axis is really like a pyramid. So foundation is going to be the adrenal glands. On top of that, we have the thyroid. And at the very tippy top, we have estrogen and progesterone. And if you're constantly chasing the very tippy top of the pyramid and trying to get that balance, but you haven't taken care of the foundation, then you expect that things keep falling out of balance. And so all of these are connected. And when it comes to estrogen, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't recognize is that estrogen dominance or insufficient progesterone can actually make it so you don't utilize thyroid hormone at the cellular level as well. In addition to that, if you have excess estrogen, whether it be synthetic or your own, that's going to take work for your liver to detoxify and your gut to move out. And if that's taking place, we have to keep in mind, these are two key organs that will help you convert your inactive T4 to active T3 hormone. So if your liver, if anything's bogging down your liver, that's one way that we can impact thyroid hormone itself. And so it's, uh, it's a very interesting thing to me that we think, you know, well, not we who are talking right now, but there's this idea of medicine that you can come in and you can give synthetic estrogen and progestin. And the only thing you'll affect is your reproductive hormones. And for people who don't know how the pill works, it works by flooding your system with enough hormones that one, it passes through your liver. So your liver takes a, a shot at detoxing those hormones, but it still passes through and is a high enough dose to shut down brain ovarian communication. And that is the mechanism by which birth control works. Now, we're talking about your brain, which is also communicating to other organs. We need research to understand, does this start impacting other glands? I'm sure it does because you can't affect one hormone and not see the other hormones get impacted as well in the body. Yeah, I think we take a very, uh, very linear mechanistic view of, of what's going on in the body, right? If it's a thyroid, it's a hormone issue, it's a uterine issue, it's a, it's a, um, I don't even think we look at it as a pertuitary issue, really. To be, mm -hmm. I think we look at individual yeah. end systems. And for our perspective, we're always talking about what's happening cellularly. And in our, in our perspective, hypothyroidism doesn't start at the gland. Uh, hypothyroidism starts as a cellular stress response, right? Use, hypothyroid symptoms are the result of insufficient thyroid hormone in your peripheral cells. And it's not a necessarily like a global thing. Multiple tissues can be affected in a stress response. And so we have to consider the fact that really some type, the same stressors that may have dysregulated your hormone physiology, estrogen hormone physiology are the same stressors that may have made change your thyroid physiology. And so mm -hmm. the connection between the two and when somebody, I think you were talking about, we can kind of pivot right into gut physiology, but gut physiology and estrogen and detoxification all, and hormone phys phys thyroid physiology all play a, a, a unique tie in everything. Uh, is It's more like this web of dysfunction than a very linear model, right? Because oh, absolutely. You were talking about how estrogen it has to go through the liver to be detoxed, but excessive le levels of estrogen actually shut down the detoxification pathways. They shut down uh, the MRP2 channels that allow things to really get in and out of the liver. So you, it all, ultimately it hinders biophysiology. It hinders and it inhibits uh, the sphincter of ODI from allowing bile to get into the GI tract to help mm -hmm. with fat, um, fat absorption, detoxification, compromise caused leaky gut. So I'll, I'll let you kind of pivot into that and kind of talk about how estrogen, maybe excessive estrogen because of uh, birth 
control uh, can really impact gut physiology. Yeah. And what's interesting about you talking about gallbladder health, and I definitely appreciate that because I, I call it the designer purse of the liver. Like it's that valuable. Like it's an accessory you definitely want to keep around. But with this, this is exactly why I hypothesize we've seen more cases of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with women who are on hormonal birth control is because those hormones impact the gallbladder physiology. And with SIBO, everybody's always looking at gut motility. Yes, and you have to go upstream from that. And that bile acid is actually toxic to those good guys who find themselves in the wrong place with SIBO. And this is a, you know, this is something where uh, we also see increased risk of gallbladder disease when women are on hormonal birth control or in cases where they have excess estrogen. Now with the pill specifically, I do want to touch on, um, I love that you talk about cellular resistance to thyroid hormone because that is hugely overlooked where, you know, I feel like it's like, you know, everybody stops with like brain, thyroid, and then maybe they go to conversion, but there is that phenomenon where the cells aren't taking it up. And one of those issues can be due to vitamin A or zinc deficiency, two things that are caused by hormonal birth control. So the pill depletes those key nutrients. And those are also needed for gut health and gut integrity as well. And with hormonal birth control, this pill specifically, there is, uh, it's well documented that there's an increase in leaky gut. So intestinal hyperpermeability, it's one of the medications that can cause our intestines to let bigger proteins through, which is why we see women start developing food sensitivities, having, this is one of the reasons reasons we see higher inflammation as well with hormonal birth control. And on top of that, it messes with the microbiome. So much so that research has compared it to antibiotics in terms of how it lowers microbial diversity, which is a big issue. And I really take issue when doctors are like, Meh, it's similar to antibiotics. And it's like, okay, but who is doing 30 years of antibiotics nonstop? Like that's, that's a very new phenomenon that we're seeing in humans. And so this is something we have to consider as well because your microbiome becomes baby's microbiome. And so these are also future mothers' guts that we are, we are you know, potentially compromising that can com compromise baby's health in the future. So we've got the leaky gut. We've got decreased microbial diversity. There's also a propensity towards yeast overgrowth in the mouth, in the gut, and in the vagina, which means that even if your stool culture is negative for yeast, you may have yeast in your mouth that you're swallowing and it's higher up. Like stool cultures are great, but they have limitations. Like all lab testing has limitations. Right. So we've got the yeast piece, and then we've got the issue with inflammatory bowel disease. There was a study out of Harvard that showed if you had a family history, so that's presumably you have the genes for Crohn's disease, you have a 300% increased risk of developing Crohn's after five years on the pill. I'm sure you guys have seen this. I've certainly seen women with inflammatory bowel disease who have this history. I had a patient who started the pill three years later, new onset of canker sores. We worked her up and there it was. She had Crohn's disease. And this was something that she was like, oh, I just thought I had these mouth ulcers and I thought it was from this boyfriend that I kissed. And like that, I, you know, she worked it out to be something else. But we're understanding more and more that hormonal birth control impacts the entire digestive tract, which is we were talking about includes the thyroid and the liver. And with that, excuse me, the thyroid, the gallbladder and the liver, it does impact the thyroid, which is, um, you know, worth touching on that if you have issues with thyroid hormone, the gallbladder doesn't function optimally, the gut doesn't actually move, and we don't have adequate hydrochloric acid. And so if you don't have thyroid hormone to stimulate parietal cells to make hydrochloric acid, you may actually end up with heartburn. So it's not uncommon to see women, I've talked with pharmacists and they're like, yeah, as soon as we fill the birth control prescription, what we see next is there's a proton pump inhibitor prescription coming next. So women being treated for GERD and heartburn, or we see the thyroid medication coming on next, or we see the anxiety or depression medication. And so when we're talking about birth control, and obviously we know it's, it's inflammatory and we always talk about the cell danger response and part of that cellular resistance is the amount of inflammation and we know that um, the birth control itself is creating leaky gut which then can create more inflammation and the birth control itself estrogen sometimes can be inflammatory as well so mm -hmm. we know that there's that link um, often women will say 
you know, I don't want to go on birth control because I heard it'll make you gain weight. Do you often see that that link between gaining the weight is from the down regulation of thyroid hormone, which then slows their metabolism? Or do you see that it is a direct link that um, the estrogen is causing them to gain weight? Yeah, there's a few reasons for uh, for weight gain with birth control, and um, <clears throat> let's let's just like for a minute here. Uh, if your doctor has dismissed your weight gain with birth control because they say, mm, statistically speaking, it's it's small or it's not significant the amount of weight that you gain. They need to spend some time in the studies because it's really eye-opening when you look at the studies and some women, they lose weight and other women, and they lose weight because they're super nauseous and they stop absorbing things and they're just not going to eat because they don't feel well. And other women, they've had weight gain well over 50 pounds. And so- they what did they do? They they just added up all the weight and then they divided by the number of women and said, okay, so it's about five to ten pounds. Well, okay, I'm not even five five. So me personally, if I put on five pounds, you notice. If I put on ten pounds, oh, that's significant for my body and my frame. So I think it's it's problematic to be dismissive of the weight gain and it can be a sign of major dysfunction. So as you spoke to, hormonal birth control is inflammatory. They've done studies where they measure CRP, C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation, and then they put women on birth control, and sure enough, it goes up. Inflammation will cause us to hold on to water weight, and so that could very well be a mechanism of weight gain. In addition, progestin, which is the synthetic stuff that labs make and they put into birth control, it's not a diuretic like progesterone is. Now, progesterone can only be made by nature. Women make progesterone, labs make progestin. So now you're not ovulating, you don't make progesterone, you're gonna hold on to water weight as well. That can be an issue. Then we've got the problem with thyroid hormone. So this may very well be the sign if you have unexplained weight gain, and I go into, uh, into this in the thyroid chapter of my book, if you have you know, unintended uh, weight gain, um, you know, you, you're not like you haven't changed anything and suddenly you're gaining weight or you can't lose weight, it could be due to your thyroid. And then there's another issue with testosterone. So hormonal birth control shuts down testosterone production in the ovaries by as much as 50%. This is why it can work really well if you've got a case of like PCOS acne and you've got excess androgens. Now, the other issue with that is that it raises sex hormone binding globulin. So Hormonal birth control alters the structure of your liver and the genetic expression of sex hormone binding globulin, which is meant to keep you safe. Like that sex hormone binding globulin grabs onto those excess hormones, but it also grabs onto testosterone. Now we see muscle mass declining. And the fastest way to shift our metabolism is to build muscle mass. But if you're losing muscle mass, then we've got a problem with our metabolism. We will see the metabolism declines and we can actually start building fat cells. And we know that estrogen and fat cells are besties. So estrogen likes to make uh, you know, fat cells plumper and fat cells like to make more estrogen. And then they just like get to hang out. And so this is something that really is a question in my mind of like, what are we doing in terms of women's health and their 50s and 60s when we have them on birth control through their 20s and 30s. This is impacting muscle mass, but also bone mass as well. And so the testosterone piece, it can't be overlooked. It's a very important component in all of this. And so, you know, through this, I hope I illustrate there's a quite a few ways that hormonal birth control may very well impact women's weight. And it's something that we shouldn't just dismiss as like, oh, well, you know, some women gain weight or it's no big deal. We have to start looking at what is the root cause and what might the mechanism be? Because another issue is hormonal birth control depletes what your mitochondria need to function. Powerhouses of your cells that make energy, this is problematic. Like this can be part of like, wow, I, you know, I can't put on muscle mass, I'm gaining weight. And then what do we see as we enter into menopause? We see that risk of Alzheimer's going up because we don't have healthy mitochondria. And so Ladies, if you're experiencing weight gain, don't like, there's this movement for body positivity. And I'm all about like love your body the way it is, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't question is is this a symptom? Is this maybe a sign of something else going on? Yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of data we just got through there. So but I, <laughs> I think so let me just I'm gonna summarize a little bit. There's multiple ways that excessive estrogen or improper estrogen physiology uh, can really impact thyroid physiology. It starts, it starts at intracellularly. So it, if excess estrogen, if it's triggering inflammatory mechanisms, it can change and alter 
uh, deiodinase activity, which can increase deactivation of thyroid hormone, uh, increase your reverse T3 and start to create some issues. We talked about it can be, it can impact uh, thyroid transport to some degree. It can increase the, the binding hormones, so there's less free hormone floating around. It can actually, estrogen's been shown to decrease iodine transport into the thyroid gland, so it actually blocks the iodine from getting in, so you can't even make it. So it sets up multiple steps where thyroid physiology can break down, and then once thyroid physiology is compromised, then detoxing estrogen becomes more problematic, and the excessive estrogen can affect liver physiology, it can affect gallbladder production, it can affect toxins from getting into the bile to be excreted, and then without that healthy bile getting into the GI tract, the estrogen can also block bile so it can't be squeezed out of the gallbladder and into the intestinal tract. And without the appropriate bile physiology and without appropriate thyroid physiology, without, without appropriate thyroid physiology, the mo migrating motor complex slows down. So the, you're gonna have a likelihood of increased bacterial overgrowth and you can get fermentation, which creates gas and bloating and reflux. And you need the bile to be absorbed appropriately to maintain the tight junctions. And if you don't have that, you drive leaky gut. And according to Dr. Brighton, the estrogen may have its own direct impact on the tight junctions as well. And both of those things disrupt gut physiology. So in summarizing even that to condense it, it's not a linear thing. And that's what's so important to talk about is you, if you're just going to somebody and they're giving you a hormone and saying, hey, we're gonna normalize your bleeding and not take into consideration that, hey, wait a second, all of this stuff, all of this stuff interrelates. And we have to, that's why Dr. Wright, when she was saying your timeline is so critically important because your timeline and all your symptoms, all of them, even the ones you don't think are important are critically important to us as a functional medicine practitioner. Yes, your general practitioner or your endocrinologist or your gynecologist, or they may be focused on their individual aspect, but for us in functional medicine, we have to look at all those things so we can really take a 30,000 foot view of everything that's impacted by the altered physiology and what I've termed it is a multi-system adaptive dis disorder, right? Because you don't just have cellular hypothyroidism or just have estrogen dysregulation. Multiple systems become compromised as a result of that. So you can't just say, I have a hormone dysregulation problem and check the box. Everything is impacted by that. And I think, and Dr. Bright, maybe you can expound on that a little bit more. I think we miss that to some degree in allopathic medicine. We're so kind of mechanistic and so singularly focused on a organ system that we totally don't pay attention or are unaware of the consequences of one dysfunctional system on another and on the treatment we provide for that one dysfunctional thing we're trying to fix on its impact on the other systems. Yeah, and I think what you're speaking to is is really important because, you know, the way it goes in conventional medicine is that if you've got a, you know, female hormone issue, go to the gynecologist. Now, if you've got a thyroid issue, go to the endocrinologist. Now, you have a gut issue, go to the gastroenterologist. And you've got joint issues, go to the rheumatologist. And it's like, but nobody's talking. And, you know, I make this joke of like, you know who does not care about the compartmentalization of medicine? your body, your body doesn't care how medicine wants to sp like splice it up. It's all connected and you have to be looking at all of these things. And we know that there are receptors all over our body for hormones. And so this idea that you can give synthetic hormones and that won't have repercussions in the body, thing where I think conventional medicine and I'm bagging on them, like I, I love me some conventional medicine, arm your body into submission because your body is betraying you and, it, and these symptoms or is it being unruly? And in reality, these symptoms are adaptation and your body's way of communicating to you. And this is something where, um, you know, I will post sometimes like your body has never been betraying you. And there are women who will come in and say, well, what about autoimmune disease? Or what about estrogen dominance? Or what about this? And what about that? And it's like, understand 
we have broken the planet. The planet is broken. And now like we are trying to continually adapt in an environment that is becoming a chemical soup. Like, I mean, from the time that I was a child until now, I mean, we've seen chronic disease escalating, autoimmune disease escalating. I mean, to your point that when you were saying that like doctors think like, oh, you don't see hypothyroidism in a, in a young woman, we're seeing eight-year-olds with hypothyroidism in my clinic with autoimmune disease. Like we didn't used to see that. Like we have children with type two diabetes. Like we are in a very different state of the planet altogether. And this idea of like, oh, well, we'll just compartmentalize the body and we will, we will essentially just make it do what we want. And I, you know, something that you also said is that, and I think it's really important for everyone to understand is a pill bleed is not a period. A withdrawal from a medication is not the same as a period because you never ovulated. You are a cyclical creature. Your hormones are going up and down every single day throughout an entire menstrual cycle that does not happen when you're on birth control. It puts the entire system on mute. Is there any other system in the body that we would completely shut down and not expect it to impact other systems? I mean, it's also something that whenever people are like, well, you know, I'll hear from doctors who are like, the pill fixes these things or the pill cures these things. And it's like, well, hold up. Like if you gave a medication, you have, you have tummy troubles here. You're having gas bloating, you know, fill in the blank of gut issues. And I gave you a medication that stopped your entire digestive tract from working. Would I be able to make the claim they fixed your gut, that we actually fixed that, we cured anything, like any of that kind of language coming around? No, because how could you shut down an entire system of the body and then say you fixed it because you just stopped it from working? And to me, this is not only a disservice, but it's very disrespectful to the female body to think that, you know, you can just medicate us and shut down our reproductive tract and then send us on our merry way with no discussion about what might be going on or the fact that our hormones quite literally give us superpowers. I mean, they can help with neuroplasticity. So this is the other question I have is like, what are we doing to women's long-term neurological health, let alone long-term health overall? Yeah, and one thing I think we've been talking about a lot of the physical side effects that can happen from birth control, but in your book, you know, you talk about how there's a psychology to taking birth control too, how it may change the way that you choose a mate, because again, you don't have those hormones that are impacting your decision making. Um, can you speak a little bit on that? Oh yeah. So this is an area where we need a lot more research. And this is, um, someone just messaged me the other day. I haven't looked into this contraceptive, but they were, they, they messaged me and said, there's a new contraceptive in development where you're going to like basically put little hormone patches on your ears. And I'm like, so right, let's get it as far away from the ovaries and as close to the brain as possible. And then let's question it in 50 years. Cause that's essentially what we've done with the pill. And what we're coming to understand as new research comes out. And I like, I just like, I was like face palm when I'm like, this study comes out in 2016, questioning how like hormonal birth control changes the structure of the female brain. You're on birth control. They scan your brain. It is different structurally to a woman who's not. Uh, it alters mate selection. It may impact how we mother and how we form long-term relationships. Community is crucial to all humans, but especially women in terms of long-term uh, health outcomes. And in addition, we don't pick up on subtle cues the way that we do when we're off of hormonal birth control, which some researchers have said like, well, it's subtle. It's not that big of a deal. If it was, we would have noticed it by now. And that to me is just like, get a little humility up in there because we are animals and there is so much that plays in the background of our mind. So once upon a time, you had to think about walking. Now you just do it. Like there's so many things we take for granted that the brain, the nervous system and the body are doing without us ever having to be aware of it on a conscious level. And when it comes to the subtle cues and missing out on things like, you know, danger signals, this is something that uh, a lot of experts are starting to question. You know, we're seeing women on hormonal birth control. They may be at higher risk of developing uh, drug addiction and alcoholism, uh, finding themselves in more risky situations, these missing out on subtle cues that may very well be what is taking place there. And so there's a lot of questions. And for people who are like, why is she saying face palm? Because we introduced this drug decades ago. We've let generations of women go on it without anybody questioning any of these things. And part of that reason is 
is because the, the story went, if you question birth control, you are anti-women. If you question birth control, you're trying to hold women back. But no, we should question everything. That is science. Science stays humble. Science stays curious. And science is always asking questions. It is never settled. Like, they, it, you know, and that is something where people will say, the depression link is settled. Birth control doesn't cause depression. I'm like, that's about the most anti-science thing you could say. We should continually question it. And it does have a correlation. So in my mind, I'm like, we don't need to argue about uh, does it or doesn't it. We need to start asking why her and not her. Because why is it one woman gets an IUD and feels insane the next day and another woman loves her IUD and is like, this Morena is the best thing to happen to me. We have to get a lot more specific so we can be individualized in our counseling, but this impact on the female brain is no joke. And we need a lot more research and investigation. And there are a lot of experts out there getting really concerned about why have we not asked this and what long-term impact have we had on women's, not just women's neurological health, but their impact. I mean, we are a very important member of society in terms, we are caretakers. We are often caretakers of our entire family and it's not just children. How does this impact the way we show up in the world? Yeah, and, and I think the, the challenge is when a lot of the, when all the, st when studies are done and when they're looking at drugs, they're looking at it from a very singular focus and we're assuming that everybody's the same, right? We know yeah. when you look at, uh, when you look at studies, they're taking, okay, we took 10 people, these people, uh, and we used these 10 people, but you don't truly know what the inflammatory state of those people are, what, this, what their cellular thyroid physiology is like in that person, what their blood sugar necessarily is really doing, what's the overall state of their gut physiology. And we assume that if we dump one drug in, that everybody's body is going to have the same effect. And that is just not the way things work. Everybody is a unique challenge. And for 10 women that have abnormal cycles, they could have that abnormal cycle for 10 totally different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but in the allopathic model where we, there's a pill for every ill, the treatment always winds up being the same. And so the, the reason, I think one of the reasons we don't see a lot, of in, a lot of study and a lot of evaluation of how it impacts all the other systems is uh, that doesn't go towards what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do with this birth control is normalize the blood bleeding cycle. That other stuff is is either a different, totally different condition, or it's not related to what this person is in front of me complaining about. We'll give them mm -hmm. something for that. And I think it's, and I don't, I always say it's, it's not necessarily that we have bad doctors. I think the model is broken. We have a model that's very uh, pill for the ill, manage disease instead of fix disease. When years ago, the, you know, long time ago, we used to try and fix the physiology. Now we, we're managing the physiology is way more profitable. And I think that's a huge reason why there's not a big, uh, a big concern as to, well, what's the side effects? Don't worry about it. We have another thing for that and we, we can just manage it. I mean, just manage it instead of getting to root cause. Yeah. And to, totally. And to your point, you know, the analogy I like to use is like, a sandwich shop versus an ice cream shop. If you are going to the sandwich shop and you're asking for ice cream, you and the sandwich shop owner are going to get super frustrated. They don't make ice cream there and you want ice cream. You need to go to the ice cream shop if you want ice cream. And that is very much like medicine in terms of if you go to your primary care doctor and you're asking for a root cause resolution and you know for them to go through your timeline, that's not their forte. That's not what they do. Are you going to die right now? They're so good at that. They're like, okay, let's get you over to the right person. Or maybe you need imaging or you need investigation. And there's stuff that they do really, really well. But when it comes to root cause solutions and really investigating, it's a totally different paradigm. It's a totally different philosophy. And you have to find a different practitioner. Not one is better than the other. They serve a different purpose. And it's unfortunate that it's up to the patient to really navigate like who does what, because they don't have a medical education. But I'll hear this so often where people are like, I'm so mad at my gynecologist because they wouldn't run a Dutch panel. And you know, they told me like, they don't know how to interpret it. I'm like, well, they did a good job then. Because if you don't know how to interpret, you really shouldn't 
running that lab. But if you can go to a doctor who does do that, like that, that's a better, you know, a better use of your time. Whereas your gynecologist, like great place to go. If you want to get a screening pap and have a screening physical exam and get baseline lab work, but just this understanding of like, there's a difference. It's not, you know, one is better than the other. And I actually encourage patients to have a healthcare team. Like it's a good idea to have a healthcare team. We know so much, but we still know so little about the human body these days that there's not usually a one doc for everything. Like there used to be that family physician who like saw your grandma and saw your baby, but we don't, we don't really do that anymore. And um, to your point about um, the way medicine used to be. So my husband's grandfather, a traditional medical doctor, started one of the first hydrotherapy clinics in the United States. Like this was a medical doctor who used hydrotherapy. Um, my mother-in-law was actually sending me photos about like his like, oh, eating like like how you should eat if you have disease and how very different that was. And that was like, that was very much allopathic medicine. And then something happened, uh, you know, where we, we got that idea of better living through chemistry. And um, it was like, we have medications. Like, don't worry about, you know, taking care of your body right now because we've got a medication or a surgery in the future. We'll just deal with it when it's a problem. And that's where we found ourselves in a bit of trouble is that one, the patient became disempowered. So, you know, and a lot of people don't think realize that, that like that was disempowering to tell a patient the only way to be fixed is in a doctor's office. Whereas, you know, all of us sitting here know that the majority of healing happens outside of the doctor's office. And the most powerful stuff to keep you out of the doctor's office is what you put at the end of your fork, how you talk to yourself, like the way you tend to your sleep, the way you move your body, like that's the secret sauce to longevity. It's not sexy. It's not made in a lab, but it works really well. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's probably a lot of women who are listening to this right now and they're thinking, oh, well, I'm, I'm screwed. I'm on birth control. What is your suggestion to them? They're on birth control in and they're either scared to come off of it or, you know, wondering what can they do at this point? What's your advice to them? Okay. So number one is take a breath and don't judge yourself for decisions you made yesterday because, you know, I get people who ask me, would you like, now, you know what, you know, would you have gone back and not taken the pill for 10 years? And I'm like, well, you know, that's this fantasy in my mind is like, yes, but in reality, I don't know. I was 20 something going to college. Like, I don't know. And I'm grateful I had that. But what I wish someone would have told me is, you need to be taking a multivitamin or prenatal while you're on hormonal birth control because it's depleting nutrients like crazy. And while your diet is super necessary, because remember, food isn't just macros or micronutrients, it's information about the environment. I think that you know, in the future, we're going to see research, hopefully while I'm still alive, on research being like, whoa, there's way more going on than this debate of like fat, carbohydrates, and protein and micronutrients, but actually what is the information being conveyed by food? So diet, we need to make sure that we are feeding our microbiome and that we are feeding ourselves in a way that aids the liver in doing its job. So six to nine servings of vegetables a day is a great place. But if you can't, if you're like, I don't even eat vegetables every day, start with a serving, start with one serving every day and increase it weekly until you get to that six to nine servings. If you are someone with SIBO, when I say eat cruciferous vegetables, you're going to be like, hell no. Like that is going to make me feel terrible. So what I recommend instead is like, if you don't know, um, you can start with broccoli sprouts or sprouting kale, sprouting cauliflower seeds. This is super economical. So you can go to like a grocery store. You can pick it up there or you can go to Amazon and order organic seeds and sprout it between some paper towels. Like you can do this in a dorm room. And the research is always winning with broccoli sprouts because that is going to help you fuel liver detoxification. I find very few SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth patients, have issues with sprouts. You don't need a whole lot of them. And remember, these vegetables are also going to provide fiber. So once we detox our estrogen out through our liver, we have to poop it out. So if you're not pooping every day, you've got to get on that. That's a very very important thing, but you must tend to your microbiome, your nutrient status, and your liver health for as long as you're on hormonal birth control. And then you need to monitor your symptoms. If you are on the pill now, 
or you, you've got a you know depot shot or implant or anything like that, and you're like, I'm having mood symptoms, I'm having headaches, like I am starting to have digestive changes, I am having skin issues. Like some women start losing hair on birth control. You shouldn't delay in getting help. Like when you go to try to heal yourself. Now I wrote a whole book guiding you. But so much of my book is here are lab tests to talk to your doctor about. Here's like things your doctor should be investigating because interpreting your own health and figuring out what's going on, it's often like reading a book that's too close to your face. You have everything you need there. Every single word is there, but it's so close to you that it's hard to read and hard to distinguish it, which is so nice if you can record all that data and then hand it over to somebody who's well-versed in this to be able to stand back and interpret that and to be able to look at your labs, look at your symptoms, and look at your history to understand how did you get to where you're at today and what's coming down the pipeline that we can avoid, which is true preventative medicine of looking at where you're at today and saying, okay, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I had a great mentor in an naturopathic school in the very first quarter of school. He said, every time a patient walks in, ask yourself, what are they going to die from? And that is what you are preventing in the future. And that might sound morbid to people, but if you can think in that way of like, what's this person's constitution? Where are they at right now? What's their family history? What's possibly going to be in their future? You can actually start intervening so much sooner. So just to recap, Nutrient depletions, we've got to get ahead of those. We need to be eating a whole foods diet. You need amino acids to run liver detox. So no, this is not just like do a juice fast. It's not like that at all. Um, you need those amino acids. You need healthy fats to build your hormones. You need to support your liver and you need to support your gut health. And then you need to work with a practitioner that can really dial in what else is going on. Because for you, you might be struggling with adrenals. You might be struggling with thyroid. As I talk about in the book, there's a correlation between hormonal birth control and new onset autoimmunity. Getting somebody to run thyroid markers and, and look at TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies Oh my gosh, like how many patients I get who have no thyroid changes, no thyroid symptoms, and there are those antibodies telling us this is what's coming. That's the time to intervene for, uh, for autoimmune disease, not once you start having symptoms or worse, once there's so, you know, tissue destruction. So that's just kind of like a broad overview. Of course, I go a lot deeper in the book of ways to care for yourself and really identify what's going on. But I really want women to understand that while you're on hormonal birth control, your natural hormones are not functioning in terms of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. And so don't chase lab testing with that. That's not really worth your time and your money to go with that lab testing. But understand there's so much you can do to be supporting your ovaries so that when you come off of hormonal birth control, you're more likely to reestablish that brain ovarian communication and have less hiccups as you, as you exit that relationship. Yeah, I think it's all good advice. And, and the, the book is just full of information that you can use. And, you know, this is a short snippet of what's going on. And I, I think to, to kind of piggyback on what you said, when you, if you're going to be on it, I mean, some women, they cruise through being on birth control, and it's, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be a major issue for them. For others, it can be a major issue, but you should be aware that um, definitely, if you're starting to have symptoms, any symptoms, you, you definitely want to let whoever you're going to uh, uh, let them know what those are, whether you think they're significant or not, they can be, you may start having allergies and rashes and histamine, like what we call histamine symptoms. And you may think, Oh, I just got, um, I'm just more allergic. I got a uh, dust mite allergy or something like that. But it really could be what's happening with estrogen physiology. So all those things are different, are, are, are important. And then I think the other thing that you said that's really important is you want to be able to walk into your doctor with those things and say, hey, here's what I'm struggling with. And make sure that you, under, that you understand that if you go to your GP and the likelihood that you're going to get another prescription is probably pretty good because they may look at those things as separate things. If you go to somebody who's more involved in functional medicine, they're probably going to look at that and say, hey, this is part of the complex. If you're, Do you need to be on the birth control? I do need to be on the birth control because I'm trying not to get pregnant. Okay, then great. Then we have to support the, hist like the histamine pathway. We know that estrogen, it really slows down something called methylation. And so that can create 
problems with histamine breakdown. So maybe you need to support your B vitamins a little bit better. If you're struggling with anxiousness or anxiety, again, that could be caused by poor estrogen metabolism or estrogen mugging your methylation pathway. And so now you have more uh, anxiety. So you may not need a, a anti, anti-anxiety medication, but it will depend on who you go see with those symptoms. So even we're all in that functional medicine world, but I want to make sure that you don't put your kind of GP in a position where they their only option is what they know, and that is to prescribe another medication. If that's not what you want, make sure that as you seek out guidance, you seek somebody who's going to, has the opportunity maybe to give you a more natural process. And somebody who really does understand estrogen physiology and the impact it has on creating dysfunction in multiple other pathways because if somebody's not really knowledgeable on what estrogen can do they may just say oh yeah it's just allergies and not realize that it that it may be estrogen that's driving your histamine estrogen that's driving your anxiety estrogen that's causing your hypothyroid physiology to occur so definitely consider a functional medicine practitioner as as part of your team they will definitely look at this uh, totally differently than your GP, your endocrinologist, your gynecologist, right? Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is something I think, you know, I just want to highlight that just because you don't have symptoms now, now doesn't mean birth control can't cause you issues in the future. And I say this because a study came out showing that six months or more on hormonal birth control in a woman's lifetime puts her at over 30% increased risk of developing diabetes as she enters menopause. So if you ever have done hormonal birth control and you're like, well, I'm, I'm going to be done you know, ovulating and having periods and I'm not going to worry about it, I still encourage you to work with a functional medicine practitioner because you may be at higher risk of developing diabetes. You may also be at higher risk of developing a thyroid condition, an adrenal condition, really any issues as you enter menopause, because as we know, once that estrogen starts fluctuating in perimenopause and then declines in menopause, all of that can impact the immune system and really every single cell in the body. And so, you know, even if, you know, I hear from women who are like, well, I did the pill like 10 years ago and I was on it for 10 years, but I think I'm probably fine now. Still, it's better to get screened and work with someone sooner before you have symptoms than to wait until you have those symptoms. Yeah. From a general testing perspective, when somebody's looking at trying to understand what their hormone physiology looks like, is there what testing do you like to run? I mean, a lot of people would say, "My hey, my doctor just ran my my estrogen, or they ran my test, my blood testosterone, blood estrogen, uh, and they said everything's good, right?" Yeah. Is, What's your, when you're looking at the chemistry of of the hormones, the estrogens, the androgens, what do you like to look at to kind of get an assessment of what's going on? Mm -hmm. Great question. And uh, the other thing about this is that doctors often don't test at the right time and in in a menstrual cycle for women who are cycling. And I talk about this in Beyond the Pill that there are women who have normal, they're like my, 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 you know, my labs look totally normal when it comes to estrogen. However, their doctor hasn't looked at the metabolites. And so you can have normal appearing estrogen, yet maybe you have more 16-hydroxy estrone, and that is going to cause swelling of your breast. So anything grows, okay? So anything grows. You can have cysts growing. You can have fibroids growing. You can have endometrial tissue growing. And so now you have heavy, clotty periods going on. And so with that, so, and if anybody listening, you may want to like rewind and listen to this again, or you can grab the on the pill. It's all in there as well. So on day three of your menstrual cycle, approximately day three, the third day that you're having your period, we're going to run FSH, LH, and estradiol. Estradiol is E2. That's most prominent in a menstrual uh, cycle. If you are not menstruating, we look at different estrogens. And so FSH and LH uh, is follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone that tells us how the brain is signaling the ovaries. And sometimes, not always, it can show us dysfunction with like PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, estrogen should be the main diva when you're getting into that follicular phase. So estrogen's rising. Then we're going to spike uh, estrogen and luteinizing hormone that triggers ovulation. So after ovulation, the corpus luteum is left behind, and that's when we want to go in and we want to test progesterone approximately five to seven days after we estimated that 
pro, uh, that uh, ovulation occurred. And during that time, I like to test progesterone and estradiol again. That way I can see what is going on with estrogen in relation to progesterone as well. Now you can get a Dutch test. You know, Dutch is a great test that you can do. You can do it throughout the menstrual cycle or you can do that day 21 approximately testing why I like the Dutch test is because we're going to see estrogen. We're going to see what you're doing with your estrogen, your estrogen metabolites. We'll be able to evaluate methylation. So methylation is that other key part. You were talking about B vitamins and also magnesium, things that are depleted by hormonal birth control. And we can look at your testosterone and your 5-alpha reductase activity and understand, are you making more DHT? Sometimes testosterone is normal, but you're converting it into DHT, which is a potent androgen. Now you have hair on your chin, chest, abdomen. Well, you lose it on your head. Nobody likes that. So we want to evaluate that. And that's especially important for women listening. You know, I get women who ask me like, how much DHEA should I supplement with? Well, it depends. And also you want to make sure you know what you're doing with your DHEA, which is an adrenal hormone that gets converted into estrogen and testosterone. So the other reason why I like the Dutch is because I can get the Dutch complete and look at your cortisol versus cortisone, DHEA, and melatonin. Melatonin is often overlooked in women's health. Um, people are always like, oh, it just helps you sleep. Mm, it helps you sleep, but it also protects against uh, breast cancer and it protects your ovaries and your brain. It's a really potent antioxidant. So it's another important thing to consider. Then we want to look at thyroid of course, and you want to get a full thyroid panel. And I really encourage if your doctor doesn't, so doctors may not run a reverse T3 because they don't understand it. If your doctor won't run it because they don't understand it, they're not probably the best doctor to be working with for your thyroid health because the reverse T3 is a really, really important consideration. And I have seen so many women put on thyroid medication when reverse T3 goes high and it's like, well, hold up your body is saying, slow down, slow your roll. Like you need to rest. Why is it doing that? We have to ask that why before we start with a thyroid medication. Otherwise we run in a big risk of crashing that woman altogether. So that's like the overview of what we want to look at. Uh, for people who are like, what's that full thyroid panel? TSH. And I like to look at the first time I like to look at total and free thyroid hormone, especially women on birth control, because often with birth control, you're going to have elevated uh, total thyroid hormone and low free thyroid hormone because of thyroid binding globulin being elevated while on birth control. That's important because your free hormones may very well look like your hypothyroid, but it's not the issue with the thyroid not producing the hormone if your total is elevated. It's an issue with binding proteins, the liver, and really it's birth control. We also wanna look at reverse T3, TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies. And then depending on your symptoms, we may go down the route of looking at Graves antibodies, but that's way less frequent than hypothyroidism. So it's not usually part of the typical screening exam. And then of course, insulin, we've got to look at insulin. And I like to look at a fasting insulin. And I also look to, like to look at a fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C um, in, in most people. There are other markers of blood sugar that we may go deeper on just depending on what's going on. But it's really important because insulin is one of those ones that, you know, we don't have a great way to test cellular resistance to our hormones like uh, thyroid. But if you see that there are signs of insulin resistance, then you can bet that other hormones are not docking and not getting into that cell as well. And so that's why that's another important piece. And for women listening, if your doctor is, I don't care if you're 25, your doctor should be monitoring your blood sugar. Because again, uh, this is better to know sooner than later, mm -hmm. but also all of these hormones are connected and you're dysfunction of what is happening with your ovaries may have everything to do with what's going on with insulin or what's going on with your thyroid and nothing to do with their ov the ovaries themselves. And if you are missing your period, aside from a pregnancy test, you should also have a prolactin test done. And interestingly, the same mechanism that causes TSH to go up also causes prolactin to go up, which is why women can go missing their period. And it can be really due to a thyroid issue and what is going on, you know, it, it, at the cellular level with all of your, with all of your hormones and less to do with the fact that we just need to give you synthetic hormones. Uh, understand you were not born needing synthetic estrogen and progestin. You, you, there's no need for those. You were born needing your estrogens and your progesterone.
Yeah, I think those are all great points. And just to tie in two of those points, we were talking about the reverse T3. We often talk about reverse T3. We talk about the T3 reverse T3 ratio, the free T3 reverse T3 ratio to see what the body is actually favoring, deactivation or activation of thyroid hormone. And a key tie in there to insulin resistance for our listeners is that if you have cellular hypothyroidism going on, if your reverse T3 is elevated or the ratios are diminished, then you need active T3 inside the cell to activate the glucose transporters. So if you have cellular mm -hmm. hypothyroidism going on to some type of stress, you will start to develop insulin resistance. It's not necessarily a carbohydrate issue. It is a cellular stress response issue causing the deactivation of thyroid hormone, decreased glucose transport. Now you need more insulin to try and force glucose into the cell. And now we wind into insulin resistance. So again, we kind of go back to the same thing that you can't really separate these systems. When you see insulin resistance, many times people are said, you eat too much, you don't exercise enough. That's why you have your issue. In reality, if you have insulin resistance, especially if you are pretty conscious of your diet, you have to start thinking about the mechanisms that create it. You may not know those mechanisms. Depending on the doctor you go to, they may or may not. A traditional allopathic physician may just look at it and say, well, you have insulin resistance. That's just the way it is. Stop eating so much and exercise more, eat less. And, but if you go to somebody who really understands the functional medicine model, they're going to look at a broader set of labs. They're going to just like Dr. Brighton said, they're going to look at kind of a broader aspect of things and why that's so important, especially when you go to a functional medicine practitioner. If you're used to only get two or three tests done and now you go to this functional medicine practitioner and they're running a whole bunch more, it's because the, what gets measured can get managed. If you don't measure it, you don't know that it's a contributing factor. So I think all those things you said were really important. And it still goes back to the point that we make all the time on the podcast, which is it's really about what's happening at the cells, not so much the glands, really more about the cells of the body because they're really signaling to the brain to say, hey, this is what we need. So cellular health is really important. So we're over an hour and I appreciate every, every minute you were on and we could go for probably another We could totally hour. nerd out forever. No, and I appreciate all of those points that you made. I think it's, it's really important for people to understand how nuanced all of this is and that, and exactly to your point that if you, if you are with a functional medicine provider, they're going to measure a lot of tests. And it's also what gets measured improves and what we're monitoring improves. And so it's, I mean, I, they, I get asked all the time, when's the best time to run labs now? Like when you're feeling well, run your labs now because we want to know your normal based on like when you don't feel well. And I think it's very short-sighted to wait until you have symptoms to run labs, which is the allopathic model of like, now you have symptoms, now we justify the labs. But all we know is this is what it looks like when you have symptoms. We don't know what you looked like before. And this is how a lot of people can slip through the cracks. Um, and I appreciate you speaking to the insulin piece as well, because all of that is very, very important and very much overlooked at how much all of this is interplaying, uh, you know, not just the hormones, but all of the cells together. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think I think one other last point, and then we'll wrap this up, is especially when you go, if you don't feel well, you need to consider a couple things. Labs can look totally normal, but mm -hmm. inappropriate for how you feel. Labs could be abnormal and be totally appropriate for how you feel. So you, just because a lab is normal and, or it doesn't have an H or L on your lab report, you really need somebody to assess them based on how you feel and function because lab values can be suppressed by inflammation, by other medications. So it's really important that you speak up. If you do not feel well, most, and you, and you, you have to let your doctor know what's going on, how you feel, and you can't just take a, well, all your labs are normal, life's good, you're just nuts. You have to be will understand that labs can be artificially normal, just like you can suppress your bleeding cycle into a normal range with medication. Lab values could be inappropriately normal based on how you feel. So make sure that if you don't feel well, you argue for yourself. It's not, we just can't look at lab values for face value all the time. Sometimes we gotta look beyond what we see and say, oh man, these values look normal, but they are totally inappropriate for what this patient's telling me. So now we have to deep, take a little deeper look. Oh, 100% to that. And I think that, you know, that's a big piece is your lab should always be viewed through the context of your story. And for women to understand that 
their menstrual cycle and their period is the fifth vital sign. And so if you're tracking that, you are going to notice that there are issues, how you feel in your body and what your normal is before your labs show abnormal. And that's the time to act. That is the time to intervene because by the time your labs start showing it, that's where disease is progressing. So I love everything you just shared there. So we're going to wrap this, this puppy up. We'll, we'll look forward to bringing you back on sometime soon in the future. But can you tell everybody, A, where they can get the book, Beyond the Pill, and two, where they can find you on the web and through socials? Yeah. Well, you can get the book anywhere that they sell books. It's in, it's across the entire world. So it's international as well. If you grab it, please go to uh, beyondthepillbook.com and grab some gratitude gifts there. We've got some exclusive interviews, some meal plans, recipes, the works for you. So there's some bonuses there that you can grab. You can find me at drbrighton.com. That's my main hub, D-R-B-R-I-G-H-T-E-N.com. I'm also on YouTube. I know we all learn differently, so you can catch videos on YouTube and then find me on Instagram at Dr. Jolene Brighton. And for those of you who are like me, you do a lot of your learning in the car. Uh, there is an audible version of it. Get it. I think you do a great job with the audible version of it. Uh, so uh, book, audible, go check out the site. Great read. If you haven't read it yet, definitely read it. Whether you're on birth control, never on birth control, or trying to come off birth control, totally worth the read. I think you did a fantastic job with the book. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We truly appreciate it. And uh, oh, we'll wait for your next book to come out too. When's the next? <laughs> Give me a minute there. But yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. And thank you for all the work that you do in the world and supporting women and getting this information. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, okay? You too. Bye.